Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Roman. How are you, How are you guys doing? Good, good. Today our show is about what dogs remember. What I forgot. Oh, uh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, what, right. Uh, but before we get started, Gaetan, I, I understand that you got a video of uh, Diane Avery from uh, Momo's Home Rescue, yeah. right? Yes. Okay, yes. so why don't we show that, all right? Okay, I was okay. about to introduce it saying that. Okay, go ahead. Part one of the process, the first thing is to rescue. And as we will discover in this interview, time is a is of uh, how you say that in English. Time is of the essence. Of the essence, and right? Thank you. So, without any further ado, here's the video. Okay, I'll add it in. I'm playing this video. Oops, where I need to go here and play it from here. There's no sound. Okay, I lost. Okay, let's let's redo it. Okay. Uh, same story. Here we go. We're gonna start again. Yeah, we'll start again. Audio. Tab. Share. Okay. Pups prior to that, uh, feral ones that people would catch and need to, you know, a place to put them, and they really weren't suitable to go in, in the house, that kind of thing. So um, then it just kind of kept growing until really we have one horse and the rest is dogs here right now. When puppies, it's, it's just, well, puppies or dog or adult dogs, either one, when they first come in, we evaluate them, give them their first sets of shots and um, give them dewormer and start them on a good feeding program. And then we just watch them. Um, we do have all kinds of medications here if the puppies start to get sick. And it's extremely common in uh, puppies that have not had good prenatal care to have them get sick. It just, it just happens almost routinely. The puppies is generally a minimum of about six weeks. Sometimes it's a little bit shorter, sometimes it's longer, um, but it's because we have to get a certain number of vaccines in them before they can transport. And they're given two to three weeks apart. So if a dog comes in today, two weeks from now, we'll get another set of shots. And then it's at least four or five days before they can be transported, even if they don't have to have a third set. Most rescues right now are requiring three sets of shots because parvo is so prevalent everywhere. In my opinion on the spay neuter is that it's the only answer. The pet population, and again, I don't know if it was recorded earlier or not, but the, they discovered back in Chicago and New York and back east several, many years ago, that they couldn't kill kitties fast enough, that they literally can't kill them fast enough. So they started the spay neuter release and that was a much better answer. The cats kept other cats out of their area and then they couldn't breed. Um, but in the case of dogs, we can't turn them loose again. However, you can't kill them fast enough because they have knitters. And there's something morally just doesn't seem right about killing them. Um, what, just because we didn't bother to get them spayed or neutered? Mm -hmm. But the spay neuter has got to be affordable. It's got, it, in my opinion, I know one of the states up north, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to say which because I can't remember which, they have a spay neuter program. They don't even ask what you make. You have a dog, you can bring it in and get it spayed or neutered free. You know, it's shots and all that. Mm -hmm. And that almost has to be the answer. People often say to me, well, can't we just adopt a dog? Well, if you notice on our boards that are outside each stall, they, a lot of them will say tag. That means that they've already committed to a rescue. And once they're committed, if we don't send them, the rescues get upset. And then eventually wouldn't take our dogs because there's, and I didn't know this when we first started doing this. I thought as long as the dog gets a good home, what difference does it make? It makes a difference because we have put in hours of work to get them 
posted, accepted, all the, the shots and everything done. The other end of the, the rescue end is where they're going to, they paid to have them brought up there. And they don't usually get a refund if the dog doesn't go. And the second thing is they've arranged for fosters or adopters there. So if the dog doesn't go, it makes them look bad, mm -hmm. or at least like they don't know what they're doing. So we try really hard not to adopt locally any of our uh, ones that have been tagged for rescue. And these transports all have to be arranged, mm -hmm. and they have to be covered financially, you know, for the gas, paying the drivers, that kind of thing. So there are some um, volunteer transports, but the majority of these dogs go on paid transports. Flights would be the ideal option because the dogs get there in a few hours. Most of these dogs that go on the ground transports, ours left from Midland, which is, okay, the dogs had to go from here to Midland. They left at five in the morning. They got to Midland around and offloaded the dogs around noon or one. And then they started the trip to Wisconsin. They're offloading today. So you're looking at, what, Friday, Saturday, you know, two and a half, three days in transit, and that's stressful for dogs. And flights would be, that's ideal. They're there in two or three hours. A couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, they called about a dog on a Monday, but I couldn't go get it that day or Tuesday. And then, but I said, we'll take it. And then Wednesday, they called to say, she's on the stay list. And I was like, don't do it, we'll come get her. You know, I was really wanting to get her that day anyway, but literally, from Monday afternoon to Wednesday, because we didn't get her on Tuesday, they were going to spare out. We got a mom dog with nine puppies from down in the lower ground, from a poor area here. And as we dealt with her, we named her Ember. She was a black and white hound type. And she was in that stall right there. And as her puppies got weaned, and all we knew she was an exceptional dog. And so, but she'd never been in a house. You could tell we had to carry her over the threshold. She had never been crated. We had to teach her to be in a crate, to walk on a leash, everything. And she eventually went on a transport. I actually paid to have her go on a, one of these small transports because I didn't think being in a van with 60 or 80 dogs was going to do her any good. But she, she now um, lives in Wisconsin, and she even has her own cat. And she's with a family that loves her. And she went from a very poor throw away dusty little town down here to living in a really nice place with a family who loves her. All the ones tomorrow are puppies that we're sending to California. The six husky puppies that are in, that are down in one of the stalls back here, uh, they came with their mom who was, came covered with blood. She had been fighting off other dogs to save her puppies. And she actually went to Wisconsin Wednesday and she has, already a uh, foster to adopt and they're so excited to get her. We named her Lyric and all her puppies have musical names. And they're actually going to California. So the mom went east and the puppies are going west. And just, she was an amazing dog, but she was willing to die to try to, to okay. save her puppies. Uh, luckily somebody saw it and intervened and, and then the sheriff brought her to us. They're also sent to all of the Northeastern states. Um, like Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, we've sent them to Maine, actually to Canada, to New York, but many go to the Pacific Northwest. They literally don't have stray dogs, or very few, and their shelters have very few dogs in them. So they're always glad to get the dogs. Well, that was great. Oop, I didn't mean, that was great, Gaetan. Nice job. Great interview. I can't hear you. But great oh, there interview. You go. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was fantastic. That was part of the uh, the filming we did in Las Cruises with you. And this is part one. And the part one is the part uh -huh. called rescue. And everybody called the rescue. This is where an abandoned dog yeah. or a dog in danger is sent to receive the basic care and the important care before they can be sent for adoption somewhere else in the country, as you described. So that's part one. And we have part two next week. Okay. If you let me show it to the public. Okay. <laughs> All right.
Roman. <laughs> yes, sir. You have something to share with us. What? I forgot about it. What's it about? A memory. Yes. Today we're talking about, don't you remember? Yeah, we, we're talking about how learn how dogs remember things. And there's logic versus episodic memory. So uh, you you gave us a PDF, which we'll be happy to go through. And if you oh, go through no, this with us, that would be great. No, don't show these people. Then they know how the dog thinks. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> and don't tell anybody oh, that you're planning okay. to publish a book, right? <laughs> it's a secret. No. Yeah. People, right. people, should, people should know. Because um, I feel we, we have these misconceptions how, how dogs learn. And um, I just wanted to give you my experience and, and what I did as a research um, for information that is accessible. And I've, you know, worked so many years with people and, and animals. And, you know, one thing is clear. Dogs have seven senses. You know, everybody talks about that, right? So um, the first sense is the smell. And if we, if we observe a dog, that's his eyes, right? The first thing we see, the most forward piece is the sense, is the nose. It extends the body. So the first thing a dog gets is the sense of smell. So the first thing a dog does, it puts up his nose and tries to get gather information, even if that's not in sight. So from there, we have hearing. So the dog knows where the direction is coming from. And that's have eight muscles per ear to be able to turn his ear around in the direction that information is coming from. We have sight. As the dog approaches in the direction that he found out, visual contact, which defines if the dog sees that as a threat or not, or is it safe. And then when the dog comes closer, he has physical contact with it, either with play or with hunting or with any types of interaction. And then the other part that the dog has gathered his information is through taste. And then we have motivation. And I know it sounds weird because the word motivation comes in weird. But the point thing on the dog motivation to get to that information, he can express himself through through vocalization, barking, screaming, right? And then what we can look for is empathy and sympathy. If a dog doesn't have empathy and sympathy, he will not be able to collect information from the other side. So if a dog is scared or the dog is very confident, that information has to be filtered and it comes in through through an emotional state. So emotion is also a part of how dogs, you know, gather information. So I just want you guys to gather that idea and put them in a place where you can look at it. How does my dog gather my information if I'm going outside for a walk? And there's a lot of information going on when we take the dog out for a walk. It's a lot of information when we come back home from a shelter or from a friend's visit, and we are all over information that we cannot hide. The dog gathers that information and, and he can respond to that. And you get this look. I know you were somewhere and you touched somebody you didn't tell me about, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we, have, for example, have breakfast or dinner or lunch, there's a lot of information out there too. And then the dog is dog food and we don't give him what we have on the table. The dog can turn a cold nose on it on his food. I don't want that. I can smell bacon. I don't see any bacon here, right? So these are things the dog will memorize and it becomes a pattern the way, right? The, the way dogs gather that information and put them in a storage. The question is, where do dogs store that information? Because considering the size of their head, they don't have that volume that we humans have. They have less volume. So where is this all information comes in for? So that dogs have a specialized memory systems that are all over the dog's body. So for example, we have biological relevant information. It's not well, how we live, it's how the dog gives it. So the dog needs to know information is of a value. We know dogs memorize things for two main reasons, to survive and to thrive. That's all they need. They don't show off like we do. They don't want to gather volume of values that they can be proud of. All they do is they just want to survive and thrive. 
And for them to survive and thrive, those information is so important and they have to be so quickly accessible. They cannot be just stationary in one place. They have to be distributed through the body according to which part of the body needs that information. Mm -hmm. So we have information that comes in genetically and is sought all over the body in each individual cell of the dog's body. And I'm not a biologist, right? It's just common sense. And each cell has that information that comes in what we call it. So we have a breed trait, that information comes in. So the dog functions as a breed, however, he has this individuality that comes in all this information that he gathers from his environmental factors. So once the dog is a breed and he behaves like a breed speak dog, like a bulldog behaves like a bulldog, a great behaves like a great Pyrenees, English this behaves like English Mastiffs. It's just not the coat. It's also the general behavior of that stuff. The individual of that individual dog is in addition to his genetics. So we have the genetics and we have factors. All those together makes the dog's character. So the dog needs information. He has access to it because in his individual cells and we have a long-term memory where the dog receives information from his environment and uses it as a long-term memory. And then we have the short-term memory. For example, a long-term memory is he sees you take a bone out of a yard and put it on top of the refrigerator. And then you go for a walk with your dog and he returns and he's, gonna, he's likely going to the refrigerator because he remembers being out there. Now, if your dog sees you putting in the refrigerator, but he sees you going outside and dig around in his place where he in his bone. The first is likely going there where he saw you digging on the bone, making sure the bone is still there. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And that, if that bone is not there, we have frustration. He remembers the bone is there, but suddenly there is not. There is yeah. no dog for that. No way that dog has a logic to assume that because you were there, you took the bone and you put it in a refrigerator. Yeah. But there is an experience that if he observed you in the past taking that bone and put it in a refrigerator, the possibility is high that that in the refrigerator, rather than you from there straight to the refrigerator and looking up and try to smell it. Yeah. And let me give you an example of how we see our experience and how we perceive. I'll, I'll tell you a short story. In my back pocket, I have usually a wallet and my cell phone, right? Now, what do you think do I have right now in the back pocket? What do Anything I think you have in your back pocket? Your credit yeah. card. Usually, hey, what? Your, your wallet and your cell phone, or your cell phone. Exactly, and why do you think that? Because I showed you wallet. Yeah. That's a logical consequence. The dog cannot answer you that question because right. he doesn't see your wallet, he doesn't see your phone, and he doesn't see you behind because you're facing. So that is not possible. But he knows that if you come for a training session, you usually, and he cannot smell treats, therefore we don't have a training session. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, it yeah. does make sense. You know, that's uh, that's funny. You know, uh, Dale says that people have six senses, taste, smell, sight, hear, <laughs> nonsense, nonsense, and no sense. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Good morning, Dale. Oh, and my brother, Ron, he says, congratulations on starting season four. The reason I say that is because um, uh, Dale has a, a pit bull <clears throat> named Gunner. And when I'm on when I'm on a uh, uh, Facebook video with him, I can go, "Hey Gunner, you want biscuit?" And he turns over and he starts barking. He knows exactly where the biscuits are on the shelf. So that's really funny. It, it's by the term and everything else, just constantly knowing where to go and get it. Yep. You you said that. And, very and nice. I, I, I cause the annoying. problem. Constantly knowing. One thing we have to be aware: the dogs are totally aware constantly of their environment to, yeah. to an extent that we can imagine. So let's say, for example, I would like you to look around you, right and left, and now close your eyes and tell me what is on your right is white that is in your reach. I can do that. What is it? 
without opening your eyes. Oh, I know, my Kleenex. Right? A dog knows exactly in that screenshot yeah. that he had before he closed what is there. So if he opens his eyes and something changed on that, he's triggered. Yeah. He's triggered to understand why this changed. But that it's constantly awareness of the now. There is no past and there is no future. There is just now, something we don't have because we either remember our problems or we are looking in our worries. And so we either in the past or in the present, uh, in the future, but never actually in the present. And this is where the missing com communication comes in because the dog has that information right now. He remembers it and we don't. We're not aware of our body either. So th what's that? Okay, well, that you're really asking. Okay, it says, if you ask a dog to um, imitate an action that was demonstrated some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, then it is something like asking, do you remember what your owner did? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I here's, a, on that. here's a little video that I thought you might, be in, can, you might enjoy. Can I make it bigger? Yeah. Perfect, episodic memory, perfect video. So these, these people are in Europe, they study animal behavior in in Hungary, Hungary. Expectations. So he remembers that process. Then the owner gives the do it command to test whether the dog remembers the demonstrated Ooh. action. Ooh. Good. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So these are things that we actually not consider, but many behaviorists should know that aspect. Because mm -hmm. if I want my dog to perform a specific behavior and fade an old behavior and bring up a new behavior, if I don't teach him the first alternative behavior, and then diminish the first behavior that I don't like, I will never be able to transition him because he should be a, she, he should see a benefit from the alternative behavior as much as he sees benefit from a behavior he offers right now. Good? Okay. So most people will read out to punishment to stop one behavior, but the right. dog doesn't see that as a correction. He sees that as frustration because he believes that action is justified. Well, right. You don't. So right. you become the problem because you do something to your dog the dog doesn't understand. He doesn't see this justified. Well, you know, that's kind of like humans too. I mean, right. don't we all think that way too? I have another issue here that I think is, I, it's not really an issue. It's a, a fun thing. Um, uh, let's see here. Now, this is about the same kind of thing that you're talking about, but this is about dogs that... Um, they they can tell time yeah the family have a regular routine christine and johnny always leave the a house short correction they don't perceive time okay okay they perceives um, they perceive long distance telepathic knowledge okay they call it time here i don't think it's time okay i'm gonna time is not a dog factor but anyway <laughs> all right let's watch you want to know why Whoop. running on the treadmill seven days a week yeah. Advertising. Yeah, I know. We get. I'll, I'll just let that go for a couple of seconds until. Skip at. Okay, there we go. Leaving Jazz to his own devices. And every evening, Christine comes home at four o'clock. But it's what Jazz does next that really interests us. And this is my Charlie coming see, up. Every evening at around 4.40, 20 minutes or so before Johnny comes home, Jazz always leaps up onto the sofa as if he's waiting for him. He's like a canine alarm clock. Between sort of half four and five, Jazz is always looking out for Johnny. It seems Jazz somehow knows that Johnny's coming home. And it's a claim made by many dog owners. But how does Jazz do it? <laughs> now, it could just be that Christine coming home sets Jazz's clock. 
We know it's not because he needs dinner or his walkies, because Christine's dealt with that. There is a theory that a dog's sense of smell could play a role. Whilst Johnny's out of the house, the smell he leaves behind fades at a regular rate. So could it be that when Johnny's scent drops to a particular level, Jazz senses he's about to return? Yeah, boy. Ah. Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah, yeah, boy. To test this theory, at the end of the week, we made a change. On her way home, Christine swung by Johnny's football club to get some of his freshly worn T-shirts. And then, when she got back at her usual time, she wafted them around the living room to spread Johnny's smell around. If Jazz is using the fading smell of Johnny to sense the passage of time, then it could be the equivalent of resetting the clock. So will Jazz still know what time it is? It's now less than half an hour before Johnny normally comes home. But for the first time, Jazz stays dozing. It's now 4.48. Jazz only lifted his head for about 30 seconds. He's lying flat out again, enjoying the heat at the radiator. Now Johnny's back. Are you coming to And to Jazz, no. it seems to come as a complete surprise. Now, let's not pretend that this is scientific. There could be any number of things that Jazz is reacting to. But it's an intriguing idea that dog's sense of smell might allow them to grasp something as abstract as time, a concept that we tend to assume only the human mind can understand. Good. I got two answers to that. Okay. I knew you would. That, that's why <laughs> I thought it was rather curious because most people believe that their dog is sensing them coming home. Right. There, there are two factors to that, to that experiment. It's, it's a totally valid experiment, and I can see where it comes from. The first thing is we have to see the dogs have rituals. The ritual is perceiving the information that the owner is here and the process of separation anxiety is ended. Mm -hmm. So the person leaves the house, we have we trigger separation anxiety and the calming part of separation anxiety is for the whole thing to be reset. Scent is back home, therefore separation anxiety is over. Separation anxiety is very important, especially for puppies because that puts them in a specific calming state. Okay. okay. The mother okay. leaves, the puppy goes into a free state. It doesn't move because it's going to die if it goes outside when the mother is not there. And that separation anxiety is being relieved and mother returns. It becomes a pattern. But that separation anxiety has nothing to do with what we see when the dog goes bonkers and destroys the house. It's a natural separation anxiety. You have this anxiety seeing your friends like Gay Tan coming back home. That was part of separation anxiety, a long term one. <gasps> She's here, I'm all right? excited to see you, Gay Tan. Yeah, now, you turn around in the high. We can see that as a time factor because we want to look at from that perspective and we say, therefore, the dog's time clock has been reset. It's not mm -hmm. a time clock, it's a separation anxiety clock that's it's on zero. However, dogs do sense a time factor into the scent. They, rec they recognize the declining of the molecules of a smell over a distance. So the dog can find the fresh smell so he can see a tunnel of more intense smell in front of him or behind him being less. And that okay. becomes the direction. So that's to that particular point. But it's not a scientific evidence. It's just an observation, very valid observation. Good point to check it out. However, there is an emotional factor to that, which is a sensory, which is called telepathy. Mm -hmm. And I was playing that game. So every time my wife calls me on my way back home, she calls me, where are you? She wants to know because I'm never consistent coming back because of clients, because of traffic. And I usually and because you're her, a man. <laughs> That's sexist. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah. So she'd ask me because she always observes that 20 minutes before I return home, one of our dogs, Barnaby, he's not anymore, goes to the door and waits for me. 
no matter what time it is, about 20 minutes before I come home, he comes to my door. Now, here's a fact. Before I come home, I usually go to a gas station that is 20 minutes ahead because I have a thing. I want always my gas tank to be full just for an emergency, right? Escape route. So I have a gas station about 20 minutes away from where I am. So I have a kind of a 20 minute radius gas stations around my house. So I would stop at the gas station and then my main change is I am about to go home. So now going into quantum physics, we have a quantum field yep. connection. And you as a healer, you know that, that if I put my intention into coming home, whoever perceives that information, who is in tune with my quantum field, perceives right. that is coming home. And therefore, the dog goes to the door. That's my explanation to that. And we have evidence of quantum field acceleration. And we have evidence that dog can smell time in a different way. Right. Not have to do. And BBC had done a video of a dog returning home because the person's intentions was to come, even if the person didn't know what time that right. was. That's right. I, and see, now I, I, I knew that there was an explanation because some people will say that uh, the dog doesn't really know. And the question is sometimes, how come you can have two people in the same household and the dog will be excited and know when one is coming home and could care less when the other one's coming home? And that also has to do with the connection with, with that human being. Right? right. Yes. Um, I'm saying where well, dogs have an internal clock, and they know when it's time. But that internal clocks are the organs itself. So right. the organs go in a specific process, and the organs have an internal time that triggers the dog to be hungry in a certain particular time because mm -hmm. he's emotionally conditioned to be hungry and not before because nothing will change anyway, and so the body will trigger it. It's our internal clock. Before we didn't have times, we went right. like that feeling. Right. Like it's time to go home. I have the needs to go home. It's not yeah. the time, it's the need that comes in. But I agree. Well, let me ask you this now. When when a when a dog is waiting for you to come home and you don't come home at that regular time, I've you noticed that anxiety. I was just going to say that it turns into anxiety. It's like, well, where is she? Where is she? Where is she? Jeez, my clock, my internal clock says it's time for her to be home. And, and then she's becomes not an there. agony. Right. Roman, yeah. in your statement, what I understand is uh, the 20 minute has nothing to do with the time of the day. It's between the time you fill the tank and you're about to come back home. At that time, the dog react of your minus 20 minutes before arrival. Yeah, because my, my mind is connected to home. Right. So my quantum field connects home. And it's right. not at 4 o'clock or at 6 o'clock or at 3 o'clock. It's irrelevant of the time of the day. Yes. That, that's very interesting. Yes. But here right. I have to say something to that. Yeah. I'm an energy healer. I work with energies a lot. And my dog, or Barbara's dog, our dog, has several Reiki attunements. So he's a healer himself too. Mm -hmm. I know many people don't believe in that, but I've, I have you know, physically evidence that dog is a healer. He comes up to you and you feel good. Mm -hmm. And every time mm -hmm. we did classes uh, you know, in, in shelters, he was part of that class and he would go to each individual person, stay a particular time there. And those people feel calmness, especially from that dog. Mm -hmm. So this dog would go to these people and give them energy as they walk through. It's right. kind of a quality of dog. Not every dog has the same. More dogs are more, more some dogs are less. Well, so, it, go ahead. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm just itching to, to echo what, what you're really saying there. One of our, our dear friends, Ellen Lockwood, she has the dog Rico, and he's a complex rated therapy dog. Uh, and it's amazing because he goes to Ronald McDonald House and he seeks out those people, those kids that are in pain. And one in particular, her name is Callie, and he's been with her for the last six or seven, six years or so. And if he knows she's got a pain in her back, he nuzzles himself behind her and he puts his body next to her. And she absolutely says, the pain is is subsiding. The pain is subsiding, yes. and yes. he has the, and and we call him miracle, the, the miracle of Rico, mm -hmm. right, Gaetan? Remember, we've had him oh, on yes. the show a couple of times. Yes. So I totally believe in that. 
So, and the final piece that we want to talk about today is episodic memories, because especially you guys who want a trained dog, you need to remember that a dog sees episodes. Now we have to, we have now this, this time is which episode, which season? Uh, season this is three? season four, episode one. Season four, episode one. Now for those who pay attention to that session, the next time they scroll through the videos and see the first five minutes of that video, they know, and they're truly watching the whole video. They will know the end of that video and they will say, I watched that video or I don't. So they have an episodic memory. They remember that subject by just watching the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we train dogs, we need that episodic memory. So the first thing we do is we help the body remember the body, the, the actions that are required. So okay. we do the repetition once, certain, third, four times, and then we start reinforcing those body actions. And when the dog starts offering those body actions on his own, we give that a name. So the dog can associate the name with the episode. So if I ask my dog to sit before the actually dog does it, his body has to remember that action that we then name sit. If okay. we, it, we associate sit with a negative emotion and a physical punishment by forcing the dog to go into sit position and the yeah. dog will never offer that on his own because it's associated with a negative emotion. Mm -hmm. But if I associate that with a positive emotion, that what my dog did, his choice to get that treat, that I call sit. So if I call sit, my dog wants to sit on his own. Yeah. Make sense? And yeah. then I can connect those individual tasks, coming, sitting, patience. Okay. Yeah with the click of the leash before we go out for a walk. Mm -hmm. Right. And now I became a job description. So if I say, let's go for a walk, I start season walk, episode one, come, episode two, sit. Yeah. Episode three, wait, come. And so all of a sudden we see that you can create a whole movie series. Season one, let's go for a walk. Season two, let's come home. Season yeah. three, <laughs> let's go play in the yard. But that's an important fact because people don't get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they wonder why can Roman help them so quickly doing online sessions, blah, 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 and behaviors change so quickly is because I teach people exactly that. Right. Teach the dogs how to create those episodic memories that people can then recall just with a name. Well, did you ever see the video? I wish I had it up here right now of the guy that taught his dog how to do lunges with him. It was a great Dane lunges. and he, he, he lunges, uh, lunges, he uh, scoots down. Oh, oh! He scoots down and he takes three steps, and then he looks at his dog, and then his dog takes does the exact same thing right behind him. It's like it's very cute. So that's again an episodic memory. He remembers so, it from the. Here's get, something yeah. you guys to have uh, aware of. There are some procedures that require the dog to forget what happened. So this quick cleaning teeth cleaning sessions where the dog goes into a treatment and he gets his forget me drug to clean yeah. the teeth under non anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And these dogs come home and most of the dogs don't remember where they are. Okay. Also children, when they do facial surgery after, you know, face incidents, they have these forget me drugs because they need to connect the tissue and still have the nerves connected. So the child has to be aware and awake while the mm -hmm. surgery happens so they can see how the, the skin responds and they connect those tissues back again. And those children, after they wake up from that kind of semi-narcosis, they don't even remember their parents. And so these drugs affect the short time memory. So if you guys go into treatment and your dog suddenly shows aggressive behavior, any kind of stuff, it's because of that memory. So you have to basically help him remember from scratch what okay. happened in the last couple of weeks. Okay, we have a couple of comments here. So let's see, okay. we've got, um, my dogs have an internal clock at 5.30 every day. They want their food. And that's very true. I see that the, the gunner will be looking around. When I was in Phoenix, I saw that he'd be looking around and he'd be ready and he'd be waiting. And it's pushing the bowl to let you know <laughs> that it's time to eat. 
I want to see you guys November uh, November first when the clock changes. If we still have the same conversation here about the time. <laughs> okay. All right. It's and then my brother. Four thirty instead of five thirty. Yeah, my, my brother is my brother is the one that was talking about when his his wife Barbara comes home, the dog goes nuts, but nothing when he comes home. They're bonded. I'm not the mama. Yeah. Uh, this comes in with a secure attachment relationship. Okay. All right. And then what did Dale say? Uh, Kathy lost her memory. She keeps forgetting to call me once in a while. Oh. Ouch. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, Dale, you can call me. Hello. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a wonderful show, you guys. Is there anything else that we want to say on this subject? It, it's, um, it's enlightening. I mean, this is a new dimension to what seems to be known, but I learned a lot today. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. We haven't well, even talked about mechanics of cognitive processing. Yeah. Oh, well, go ahead. Uh, if you want to talk no, it, about it. If you have 30 seconds, go thing. for it. <laughs> yeah, right. No, uh, what we like about doing the show from a, from a uh, quantum level, there is so much that we can learn from dogs, and dogs are connected with us. So that if we put what, what Roman was saying before, Gaetan, is that it wasn't until he left the gas station that he consciously thought about, I'm on my way home mm -hmm. and his yeah. dog picked up on that. So right. when, uh, and, and I don't know if everybody else picked that up as well. It doesn't matter what time he's coming home. It's when he makes the intention that I'm on home. my way home now yeah. and that energy gets, um, uh, oh, Lord. right. Into that. Let me tell you a very quick story. I used to do harpoon fishing when I was in Greece. Uh -huh. so, of course, you know, perfectly everything pulled up, the mask, the suit, the gun, everything. It was a whole... The dress whole, up, yeah. Exactly. And then I went into the water and there was no fish there. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. So obviously I would not spend hours there finding no fish. I put my gear off and then enjoy the nice blue water. Yeah. Guess what happened? All the fish were around. <laughs> And I was like, what the fish just happened here, right? Yeah. So I went back in and grabbed my harpoon, jumped in the water, and everybody was gone. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, you know what? Roman they was see, coming. <laughs> yeah. They see my harpoon. That right. was my thought. Obviously, you go fishing with harpoon. I didn't. And then I recognized, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to hide my harpoon close to my body. And it wasn't visible. Definitely not. And those fish still disappeared. And then I dropped my harpoon. And the fish disappeared. And I was like, so it's not a harpoon. What is it? And then I recognized I'm going into that water with intention to hunt. I'm going in as a hunter. Yeah. Right? And I said, wait a minute. So if I change my intention, would the fish come out? I took my harpoon and I went into the water being scared of the big fish coming to kill me. And guess who came out first? The fish. Yeah. Yes. Right. So dogs do have an experience genetically from hunters. I'm not. I'm not saying about the fish you find anywhere in the ocean, but those fish who are smart on the beach, they can feel the vibration of a hunter and the vibration of a swimmer, mm -hmm. and they make that distinction. And if you go in with the option to hunt, you get no fish. If you go in with the hunting to observe, you likely see fish. And I didn't think that through the whole thing until I saw a video again from BBC or National National Geographic where there was a lioness hunting gazelles. So she was hiding in the bushes and didn't move because they had a double screen. The, the lioness and the pack of animals that are grazing around, she didn't move. But suddenly, everybody was running. And I was like, what did just happen? And I know that it wasn't a kind of a combination of films. So it looks like right. how National Geographic does it. So it looks like an episode. You know, you can see the one video where the lioness sees the animal and they explode. But the other time you see a zoom of the animal doing nothing. And I don't think the, the, the producer actually had that intention. But I captured that moment and I says, what makes this gazelle run even if that predator didn't move? Mm -hmm. right. And then I remember my fish hunting thing. I was like, oh my God, these animals in order to survive, have their emotional antennas out there trying to sense a predator. Right. Now, for you guys who sit in the bus, okay, all these pretty women and all these pretty men, and suddenly you feel somebody's watching you and you turn around and you see this person staring at you, 
why do you think did you just feel that? You can feel it, right? Yeah. You can feel the predatory intention just like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So the dog can feel predatory intention. So you feel predatory intention. And those smart fish can feel predatory intention. So there must be something out there that triggers out to be sensitive that's right. to an attack. And that's how we survive. Mm -hmm. That's a good subject to have, predatory intention in the future, to find out why dogs, uh, you know, they're that way about their food, about other dogs. And it's funny because I can tell when – my Charlie and Rex, which which is the other dog in the house here, when Rex and the two of them, if they are going to get in an argument, I sense it immediately, and I can I can just tell just by the 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 mo the way their bodies look. You said the, you said the energy coming up. You see this I see it. cloud of knowledge. Yes, idea comes up. We have a problem. You pick up on that, and then you look to the dogs, and you see that event happen. That's it. That's, that's it. That's and stop it before it even happens. Okay, well, thank you very much, you guys. And Gaetan, beautiful, beautiful video. want to thank Barkhouse for gives, giving us the opportunity to uh, actually film mm -hmm. in uh, Las Cruces when Gaetan was here. And thank you again to Diane Avery and I'm Almost Home Rescue. Thank you, Roman, for being here. And we will see you next week. Hey, by the way. Yes. This, this is the show 79 since we started this year. Ah. Two seasons of, of 26, that's 52, plus a third season of 26, that's 78. Yep. And this is the show 79. Okay. So, so to speak, so if you call in Jeep, the company, who has also the 80-year announcement, we kind of kind of do a merge session. <laughs> yeah. We should have an anniversary party. <laughs> exactly. Yes. We okay. are 80. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> the you, next everybody. one is 80. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sure.